so glad that you joined us for this week's message from Anchor Chapel in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Our prayer is that you are both challenged and encouraged today. So be blessed as you listen to this week's message. So the screw tape letters is really one of my favorite works of C.S. Lewis. And um, so we decided to go ahead and put this film together. And since they're both in this room, I want to give mad props to Baron and Brandon Creighton over here, man. Such a great job helping with this project, this fun little project. But I think that something like this helps you to understand what goes on behind the scenes of what we see on a daily basis. And it's one of the reasons I love this book, The Screw Tape Letters. If you haven't picked it up, if you haven't read it, go ahead and read it. It just gives some really good illumination to what's going on in the supernatural, how demons try to destroy our daily walk, how they try to derail us. And I just think it's so enlightening and helpful. So really, that's today. That is the theme that I want to wrap up this series that we've been in Ghost Stories with. Uh, we started off at the beginning talking about the difference between light and dark, and there is light and dark. And now I want us to look at what it is exactly that the enemy will do and how his goal is to hide behind so many things that we see as that we see as harmless but he's really doing something behind the scenes and I want to challenge you to take the authority that you have in Jesus and begin to fight the fight that we're all in um, so man I don't know if you guys have um, have found the best restaurant that you like in town yet but Brooke and I were really excited about a year and a half ago because we thought we found the best restaurant in town and Brooke and I love to eat, um, and we, were, we found this place, this buffet. Y'all, like, if you can find a good buffet, it's good news. And, but I have never actually been to a Mexican buffet before. We find a Mexican buffet in town. And we are so pumped up. We go, and we fill our plates up, and we get food for our kids and everything. We are pumped. It's like, dude, this food smells amazing. Like, everything is just, like, so great. It seems, like, so authentic. We love, like, authentic Mexican food. So we sit down, and we're all eating, and we're like, dude, this stuff is delicious. I'm serious. We have found our place. This is amazing. But all of a sudden, that amazing experience was ruined by the presence of something that you do not want at your dinner table. So we are sitting, we're all at this table right up against the wall, and from the, from the bottom of the table up crawls this roach. And this roach comes, and it just sits. It just parks right there, and it's looking at us like, yeah, I was just in your food. <laughs> and we were like, oh, my gosh, this is real oh, gross. And, like, try to, you know, like, get it out of here, you know? And, like, and we were just like, I can't even finish my plate. I'm like, I'm going to go for seconds. Like, normally, I'm like, I'm like, I can't even, like, I can't do this. Like, I can't even. So I'm like, I'm, like, I'm not going to finish eating this food. So, like, we leave, and we never go back. But the problem is, you know, I was talking to somebody about this a couple nights ago at a restaurant, and he's like, bro, like, you know there's, like, roaches in the kitchen right now, right? Like, in every restaurant. They're everywhere. And I'm like, man, don't ruin it for me. I just, like, I'd rather just not know, right? I'd rather just not think about it. And But the truth is, like, I'm sorry, guys, if you don't know this, but, I mean, like, the FDA gives, like, a, there's, like a, there's, like, a certain amount of insects that we can ingest, and it'd be okay. It's in your cereal. It's everywhere. But I'm just like, I just don't want to know. I don't want to think about it. And I think that's when many of us look at the supernatural side of this world and this fight with, like, it, many of us, like, we're believers, and we know, and we read the Bible, and we're like, I know there's something going on, but I don't really know about it or know how to talk about it. I don't know how to, how to pray in this supernatural world. So I'd rather just not talk about it. And, and we who are spiritual beings who live for eternity end up living this life on this earth in such a practical manner that we end up, there's no power, there's no authority in our lives, and we just try to do good things and, and just live a certain way. But there's, there's an aspect to our Christian walk that we oftentimes ignore, forget, or just don't know how to live in, in, this, in this war that we're in the middle of. So I want to today, as we talk about this, I want to try to bring a little bit of light. I want to try to help you a little bit, but I do want to also warn you, anytime that Brooke and I have over the years, um, through youth ministry or whatever, have preached on the supernatural, we've seen and like multiple attacks in our lives. So where the enemy would come and he'd be like, oh, you want to talk about me? And you go, try. I'm going to bring something. And so like there'd be something that would go on, some sickness or some outside thing that would just be attacked. And you're like, all of a sudden you're like, this is not normal. Something's going on. So just want to warn you, as, as anytime that you try to bring light or you try to address a supernatural problem, the enemy will turn up the heat. But I want you to be, I want you to be strong in the mighty power of God and understand the authority of Jesus is in you. You can handle it, but I just want you to know he's going to try to come at you. But this is worth talking about because it will equip you and it will strengthen you. Here's what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. He says this in Ephesians 6. He says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil, meaning he's trying to fool you. He's doing something behind the scenes. For we are not fighting flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So the picture that Paul sets up is, listen, there's something going on in this world that you can't see with your naked eye, but you can be in tune to and know how to fight if you just hold on and and grab the power of the Spirit of God that's inside of you. This is how you fight it. This is what C.S. Lewis writes, and this was part of the the short film that we shot in Screwtape Letters. He says, the fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. This is one of the strategies of the enemy. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to rise and his mind suggests to him something ridiculous, something so silly, a picture of of a devil or a demon in red tights with a a pitchfork and persuade him that since he can't believe in that, he therefore can't believe in you. I think many times we think and we ignore the fight in the supernatural because that's that's our picture. And we think that that's what the enemy's doing, that like, that like his, his power is like, what's he going to do with a pitchfork? Is he going to like poke you? I mean, like, what's, what's going on? There's something, it's like, that's all he has? That's not all he has. And that's not what he looks like. The Bible says that he was a minister in heaven and he parades around like an angel of light. And now he is the prince of darkness in this world. He has incredible power, but his, his really, his MO is he knows how to disguise himself. He knows how to hide behind all kinds of different things. So there's going to be this moment where he's hidden. And I think many of us, we have this, I I don't know about you, but I have this like fantasy of knowing what what other people don't know. I've always wanted to like, I've always wanted to like know what's going on behind the scenes and have this like sixth sense almost, like like Spider-Man Spidey sense, you know, like where you just like know what's up all the time and know how to pray and know how, like whenever you watch movies, for me, like if I'm watching a spy movie or a superhero movie, like the coolest things to me are the fight scenes where like, you know, it might be like Batman, for instance. Batman's like fighting people, you know, and he's like, pow, kablam, you know, and like fighting. And just like, and then like all of a sudden in the middle of his fight, he'll just be like, pow, and he'll like kick this bad guy behind him. And you're like, whoa, like I thought, I thought this dude was going to take Batman down, but he knows that this guy's coming because he's a real superhero. Like he's, he's the man. And like Spider-Man will do the same thing. He's just like, he's fighting. And then all of a sudden he's like, the spider sense will come on. And he'll just know something's behind him. And he just, and he's ready. And I think we all have this tendency to think like, man, wouldn't it be cool if I knew what was up, if I, if I knew what, what was being kept from me, like what a cool superpower it would be to be able to fight off what you can't even see. And that's really what Jesus has offered us and told us to do. He, he commanded us and he said, listen, when I leave, I'm going to leave my Holy Spirit with you. And even though we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, the Holy Spirit of God does. And he enables us to fight the fight that you can't fight with your naked eyes. So he teaches us how to pray. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit even prays for us when we don't know what to pray. So there's a, there's a power and there's a source of strength and ability that, that the Spirit of God gives us in this fight against what we can't see. Um, many times there's something going on behind the scenes that you don't realize or recognize, but I think it's important for us to bring clarity to those things. I've been having this nerve pain in my leg for, for years. And, and I've, you know, people have said, like, maybe it's your sciatic nerve, it gets pinched, you know, or whatever. And I've always thought it was that. And a few months ago, I had gone into the chiropractor because I had, like, neck pain and headaches. And, and he just, like, took x-rays of, like, all kinds of um, different sections that, that were hurting on me. So he took this x-ray of, like, my hip area. And I, I've got the the, the photo for you guys. So this is the photo of the x-ray. And if you don't know what to look for, you might not see it. But so I've, I've went ahead and I've circled it for you. But on that second to last vertebrae, the little like shark fin part that sticks out, I don't know if you can tell, but it's, it's broken. It's like severed off. And that little part is just like floating in my back. So because of that, that second to last vertebrae slid down and my, my posture is not right. He, the guy said I'd be like seven feet tall if it wasn't for a mess. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, that little, but that little last vertebrae is, is like always putting pressure on my spinal cord. And if I move the wrong way or whatever, or I do a backwards kick, um, you know, I can feel it in my legs sometimes. And so I was just like, to me, like, my first response was like, awesome. I've got a broken back. And I'm like, I'm still walking around. I'm like, pretty amazing. So like, this is my, <laughs> but the second thing I was like, I was like, oh, that explains a lot. 
that explains a lot of like the pain that I've been feeling and like what's going on. And now, now I get it. And I think it's important for us to understand that like there's always something going on in the supernatural. And not, I'm not the kind of person who like who says like everything's a demon. I don't think that we live in a fallen world, and, and a lot of stuff is just your fault. It's my fault. So there's gonna be things that we just they're the they're the fault. They're the reason for they exist because of sin. So I understand that, and not everything's a demon. But I think that I honestly I probably don't give enough credit to to demonic forces trying to derail my purpose. So and, and what I want to try to do just in this is say like, listen, like maybe the pain you're feeling, maybe the thing you've been suffering with or you haven't been able to overcome, maybe it's because you're really in a fight. You're in a battle for your life because the enemy wants to steal, to kill, to destroy you. In Matthew 17, I want to look at a story where this is just, this is a miracle that you've probably heard of that Jesus does. It's just a really cool miracle and Jesus like totally just drops the mic in this story. But in verse 14, it says this, at the foot of the mountain, and, and this mountain is what is known as the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus takes uh, his favorite disciples up to this mountain, and Elijah and Moses are on this mountain, and they show up with Jesus. Jesus is transfigured into glory, and God speaks right there, this is my son, and all this stuff, you know, and, and like Jesus is shown as like, he is God, okay? So his disciples see this, wow, this is like, this is Jesus' moment. So on that mountain, they came down, and this is what they're met with. A large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and he knelt before Jesus. Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and into the water. And what I think is interesting about this is, is what we see right here is something that you probably see all over the place. You probably see people with sickness or people struggling with different things. And today, we don't really give demons credit for anything, do we? But we still live in the same world that Jesus lived in. And demons still have the same power that they had then. And demons want to mess with you. They, want to, and they, can, they can manifest physically and mess with you. So I think you've got to be open to the fact that we might be fighting a supernatural fight here. This is what's happening. So I brought him to your disciples but they couldn't heal him. Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people. How would you like to be one of Jesus' disciples then? You're probably like, oh, what are you talking about? I'm not the, you know, like, you faithless and corrupt people. How long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. I'll take care of it. Then Jesus rebuked the demon in the boy, and it left him. From that moment, the boy was well. And afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast out the demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I'll tell you the truth. If you had enough faith, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move, and nothing would be impossible. And what's interesting about this story is that Jesus calls the disciples on their faith. It's like there's this, there's this really fascinating miracle that happens right here, but the disciples are like, man, why couldn't we do something about this? Now, this story is found in two other Gospels. And in the other Gospels, it does mention that the disciples, that, that the man had brought his boy to the disciples to cast out the demon. So at the very least, we know the father assumed it was a demon in the boy. Now, it doesn't say that the disciples knew what to do or how to deal with this. All it says in all of them is that the disciples tried to heal the boy. But Jesus' approach is not to heal the boy. Jesus didn't look at this as a sickness that needed to be healed, but there was a demonic attack that needed to be cast out. So Jesus saw it differently than the disciples saw it. And I think that's why Jesus calls them on their faith. He's like, listen, you don't have enough faith. And in the other gospel, in the other gospel accounts, this is where Jesus says this kind of demon only comes out by prayer and fasting. So there is a preparation that you need to be ready for. And I think part of that preparation is what Jesus challenges them to. He talks about faith. Why would Jesus talk about faith right here? I think we have this tendency to think that faith is, is just like trying really hard. It's just like wishing something that isn't real or that doesn't really exist, wishing something into action. And I think that we have this tendency to think, well, I don't have the power to do that. I'm not that strong. I can't, I'm, I, don't, I can't just wish something into existence. But I think what's fascinating about this story is that it looks to me, and I'm challenged by this, I think Jesus has more faith in us than we often do in him. Jesus, Jesus believes it. He's like, I'm giving you my spirit. I'm, I'm enabling you. I'm leaving the responsibility of my church growing in your hands. I trust you. I'm giving you everything you need to accomplish it. But many times, like his disciples, we're like, oh, that's a Jesus thing only. I can't really do that. But the Bible says that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. There is an authority in us that we have. But faith is not just like this I'm going to make it, this is the first, I'm just, I just want you to get two things today. First thing is faith is not spiritual constipation. And many of us, we have this idea, and we think that that's what faith is. That faith is, oh God, you can do it, I just trust you, I don't really know what that means, but I'm going 
God, I'm going to pray harder. I'm going to use all the religious words I know how to say. I'm just going to, I'm going to say stuff that sounds spiritual. I'm going to sweat. I'm going to talk louder. Like you think that's what faith is. But that's something else. That's constipation, and that's never fun. And this is not, I don't think this is what faith is or what Jesus is challenging us to. The Bible says in Hebrews verse 11, it says that faith is the evidence of things unseen. What I think faith is, is being able to see what other people can't see. And Jesus came to the story, and, and he doesn't just see a boy that needs to be healed, but he sees a demon that's attacking this boy. Jesus saw what they couldn't see. And I think that's what we've got to be challenged to today, that faith is seeing what other people can't see. And, and not only is that whenever it comes to asking God for the impossible, but I think it comes whenever we're fighting the supernatural, our faith is not just a thing we believe. It's not this mantra of beliefs that we can spit out. That's, we use this term like, it's my faith that keeps me whatever. Like, faith is, is the evidence of something. It's real, and you believe it, and you see it, even though maybe nobody else sees it. So faith is what enables you to fight against the enemy. You can see what maybe nobody else can see. I don't know if you ever played this game, Where's Waldo? But I hate, I hate Waldo, guys. I hate this game. I remember I've always, I've looked at books, I've looked at pictures, and they always like, it was like, can you find Waldo? I'm like, I don't really care. I don't care where Waldo is. Like, his name's Waldo. Nobody likes Waldo. He's wearing a red and white striped shirt. Nobody cares about Waldo. I know what you're doing right now. You're looking for Waldo. Let me just help you out. I already found him. Okay, he's right there. So there's Waldo over there. But I remember thinking, nobody cares where Waldo is, right? Uh, but but, but our, 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 the supernatural fight and the battle that we face and what faith really is, it's kind of like this. It's, it's being able to find what nobody else can find. And if you didn't know anything about Waldo, you would never be able to find him. You'd be like, oh, is that guy Waldo? Is that guy Waldo? Is that guy Waldo? No, but you know who Waldo is because he's wearing that silly red and white hat, silly red and white striped shirt. He's got those silly glasses. That's because you know what he looks like. And I think that that's part of what fighting the battle in the supernatural, you've got to know what the enemy looks like and sounds like. That's the way that you find him. That's the way that you can fight against him. You've got to know, you've got to be able to find where Waldo is. But none of the disciples saw it. None of the disciples were able to see the real threat to this boy. And this happens in our life all the time. There's so many things that go, that go on. There was, a, there was a girl that um, Brooke and I were student pastors for about 11 years. And, and in, that, in those 11 years, we had so many students that uh, just felt like this, you know, this supernatural, spiritual oppression. And we would go and we'd pray with students and we would, we would try to help them to find freedom in those areas. And one, one time there was a girl who was like, she's just so sweet, but she would have the goriest nightmares. And she would have these nightmares of, of, of murders and just bloody gore. Every, and she was like, I don't know what it is. I don't really, I don't watch horror movies. I don't know what this is. And so we, we thought, like, man, this sounds like a, a spiritual attack on your peace. So we'd love to pray with you if you don't mind. So we went to her house, and, and we're praying in the living room. And then I asked her, I said, would you mind if we see your bedroom so that we can, like, see what, what environment you're, you're in? So we go in her bedroom, and, and she, you know, she was a new believer. She didn't really know any better, but on her wall, she's got this, like, big Chinese fortune calendar that was out, and she would look at it every day because it would, it would tell her about her identity, and she would try to remind herself who she was according to this fortune so that she wouldn't believe these things. And then right above her bed, she had a Native American dream catcher that was hanging there. And, and if you don't know what that is, it's a dream catcher was created to catch the evil spirits who would give you nightmares, and it would protect you as you sleep. And, and I just remember talking to her. I was like, listen, I don't want to, I'm not trying to, like, tell you what to do, but you've asked me, a Christian pastor to come and help. And from my perspective, I think you've got to get this stuff out of your room because you're, you're, asking, you're asking for help from, the very, from, from what I believe is the very same cloak that the enemy will use to introduce other supernatural attack. You've got to get these other things out because we, only, we need Jesus and Jesus only. There's nothing else we add. There's no foreign religious thing that we can add in that will bring any strength or help to us. It's all Jesus. So, so we just challenge her to do that. She took the calendar out. She took the dream catcher out. We asked her in a week, how are the dreams? No nightmares. We asked her in a month, how are the dreams? No nightmares. And for us, as long as we knew her, no nightmares ever again, because she removed what the enemy was using to hide behind and bring her torment. And I think you've got to be careful. You've got to understand that the enemy is going to try to hide behind all kinds of things. He's going to try to hide behind all these things that we think aren't really, they're, they're not that big of a deal. But Jesus rebuked a demon. He wasn't just looking at the, the need for healing, but he saw this boy needed to be freed from a demonic attack. 
And the enemy will live and try to cover, he'll try to cover up what he's doing by all kinds of things. One of the things that C.S. Lewis wrote about in the screw tape letters is he wrote, he says, um, or screw tape is writing to his nephew Wormwood, and he says, one of the things you can use is patriotism. You use patriotism, and that can be a mask, and you can get this guy distracted from the, from the real purpose of a Christian by, by getting him invested in patriotism. By, by, and there was all these other things, all these different things that, that were listed. But I just thought that was so fascinating that God, that, that I, think, I think it's dangerous for us to, like be, to take anything that is not a Christian value and elevate it to the position of a God. And many of us, you see Christians who are like elevating their, politi- their politics or elevating uh, you know, their opinion about some social issue on Facebook or whatever. They elevate all that to God. And if you don't line up with their beliefs, all of a sudden you become an enemy, whether or not you're in the church. And I think anything that can cause division in the church and, becomes, and, and gets above the unity and the advancement of the local church, you got to be careful of that. But so many Christians are getting behind all this stuff that doesn't matter for eternity. You're not going to be judged on some of the stuff you live and die for on social media. You're going to be judged by what did you do with the name of Jesus and how did you advance the gospel. That's, that's where our reward in heaven is going to come from. It's not going to be about who you voted for. I'm not, saying you don't, I'm not saying you don't have a responsibility to vote. You do. You need to vote your Christian values, but that is not God. There are so many things that we place in this value above, that we value above Christianity, we value above church unity. Any time that you put anything above, and there's, and there's strife in the church, there's some of you today that you have different opinions. But my prayer would be that this church wouldn't be divided because of other secondary beliefs. Don't let anything rise above or be more important than the advancement of the gospel. And when the world looks at us, they laugh whenever they see division. And when the enemy sees us, he says it's working. Because he's been fooling us. He's been trying to get us distracted, and he uses all kinds of things. So it might be, for you, it might be personal offense. Somebody offended you, and now you're mad at them. And Jesus said, don't even come to the house of God unless you go make that right with your brother. Don't come and worship. Don't come and bring your gift over here. You need to go make that right with your brother. So all the stuff that we do, we come in here, and we put on church, and we sing, and we do all this, and we wear all the right things, and we pray the right songs. If you've got personal offense or you've got division among the church, none of that stuff matters, and the enemy's laughing all the way. He's like, I'm winning. I'm winning. They don't even see it. I think one of the reasons that the enemy doesn't have to manifest so much today, he's not like, you know, people ain't crawling around like snakes, you know, whatever, like, like you would think that that would be demon possession or whatever. The enemy doesn't have to do that kind of stuff because we're already so divided. We're already so distracted. And too many of us are looking at porn or we're doing all kinds of other things that are just like distracting us and pulling, away, pulling us away from gospel advancement. And the enemy's like, I don't have to do anything else. I do my best work when they don't even know I'm here. And I think that's what we've got to be careful of. You are in a battle. You are in a fight all the time. You can't just, you, you can't let the real enemy of your soul remain hidden. Whenever we were in Albania a couple weeks ago, one of the things that I thought was just, it was fascinating to me, there were these bunkers all over. And I researched it, and there was about five bunkers every square kilometer in Albania. And there's these concrete bunkers everywhere. And in these concrete bunkers, the, the, the reason these were created is from 1960 to the 80s, um, Albania was a communist state. And actually, the leader at that time, the leader's name was Enver Hoxha. And he had said that Albania, he declared Albania the first, the first atheistic state, the first country ever to be completely atheist, no religion at all allowed. And what he convinced the Albanians to do is to build these bunkers, and it almost ran the whole country bankrupt. And they built these bunkers all over the place because he, he said, any day the Americans are coming and they're going to kill us all. Well, America was not, we were not in this fight against Albania, but this was this guy's belief, and he had caused all of them to believe this, this lie. So people are building these bunkers, and they're protecting themselves from all this stuff that's not even real when the real threat was their own leader who had taken religious freedom away. And I think how many times has the enemy told us to build up bunkers, to put our value, to build our life on things that don't really matter when the real enemy is already just speaking to us. And he's robbing from us. He's stealing from us. We've got to be careful of what the enemy is actually doing. I think Jesus told the disciples, you don't have enough faith because they couldn't see the real enemy. The second thing I want you to get today is faith isn't believing something that isn't there, but faith is seeing what is unseen. Faith is seeing what is unseen. 
So whether that comes to believing that God is able and, he's po- and it's possible through God, I see that God can do it. That is faith. But the other side of that is believing we are in a battle, we're in a fight, and there's something going on that I can't see with my naked eyes, but I know it's there. You've got to have faith in order to fight the enemy. Right? So Judah has been playing soccer the last few weeks, um, probably about a month and a half now. And what I cannot do is I can't convince Judah that he's in competition. He has no idea. So I'm at, I'm at Parkview Baptist last night, and, and um, we are, we're walking down one of the halls, and there's this like, big trophy case. And I, I pick up Judah, and I say, Judah, look at all these trophies. This is what happens when you win something. <laughs> now, I, don't know, I know you don't know, <laughs> but this is what you fight for. This is why you play soccer. You want, you, want that, you want that trophy right there. You want a little Judah with a little golden soccer ball. That's what you want. And I'm, th- I'm explaining it, and I'm like, this is so stupid. Like, why am I telling him this? But the problem is, I'm on the field, and, I'm ta- and, and, and Judah's playing, and Judah has zero concern about the game. He's in his red outfit. The other team's in, his white, in their white outfits, and he's just running around. Not even, he doesn't even have his head up. He's not looking at the goal. He's not looking for the ball. He's just running around, and he's watching the other kids' feet. Wherever they go, I'm going to go. That's all he does. He's just running around following them, and he looks so adorable, but he ain't doing nothing. Every now and then, the ball will come, and he'll just, like, kick it. And, like, I'm just like, dude, it's not just about, it's about winning, okay? You've got to win. And, here's, and I'm not like this, I'm not the kind of, I'm not the psycho dad, but y'all, <laughs> this, the other team is like kicking the ball and he's following around, he's just walking around, the other team kicks it in and like their team starts cheering, you know, and Judah starts clapping. And I yell from the sideline, stop it, <laughs> stop clapping, <laughs> they're the enemy, <laughs> I know they're little girls too, but just run them over, do whatever you got to do. <laughs> I'm kidding, um, kind of, um, so, but I'm like, son, this is a competition, they're the enemy. You've got to crush them. You've got to, you know, I just, he doesn't get it. He's like, dad, this is like total fun. He's probably like way more right than I am about this. But when it, when it comes to our supernatural walk, when it comes to our life, many times we don't even realize we're in a fight. And we don't understand, Paul said, that we run a race to win. That we're not just running around as Christians. He says, I'm not just shadow boxing, but I need to land some blows. There's something going on here that is deeper than just the surface. I'm not putting on a show. I'm not just acting like a Christian, but I need to land some blows on the enemy. There's a competition for your soul every single day of your life. And you need to act like it. You need to act like the enemy is coming to get you. Uh, a couple of years ago, before we moved out here to Baton Rouge, uh, I remember my dog ran to the, to, the yard, to the door in the backyard screaming one day. She runs to the, to the yard, and she's screaming, you know, and I'm just like, oh, what's going on with this dog? Like, like this is not normal, right? So I walk outside, and as I walk out, I see her run. I, see him, I had seen her run from the corner of the yard, and I run out to the corner of the yard, and all of a sudden, I get hit right here, pow, and I get hit in the back of the head by ground hornets and all of a sudden I find myself in a swarm of ground hornets and, and, and like these things are just like coming for me so I take off running into the house now I'm whimpering like the dog because I'm like I'm allergic y'all so like I can swell up I got stung right here one time my eye was shut for three days uh, I, I got I got stung in the hand my pinky one time Michelin man in my hand right here I got stung on my leg when I was a kid couldn't even put on shorts I was like it's just I, I get it bad if I don't get some Benadryl immediately so I get stung and I'm like uh, and Brooklyn had just, we had just adopted Brooklyn. I was like, I've got to protect Brooklyn. And I don't remember if Judah was, um, was with us yet, but I remember just thinking, I've got to protect my family, right? Um, so I started looking on Amazon. I'm like, I've got to take care of these ground hornets. So I, uh, I, I look on Amazon for a, a beekeeping suit. And I'm like, I'm, like, I'm going to go out there, and I'm like, I'm going to kill these, these hornets some kind of way. So I look online, and I find this suit, and I'm like, I'm not paying $35 for this suit. I'm never going to use it again. So uh, I'm a good Cajun, so I'm, I'm going to make my own beekeeping suit. So I did. Uh, so I got, <laughs> I got my ski pants. I got, I got like this, this rain jacket on, you know, and I taped up every hole. I got a spaghetti calendar on my face so I could breathe. I'm just like, I'm ready. So I go out there. I got a gas tank. I fill up the hole. They're, they're all under this old stump. I fill up the hole, and I take a, I take a match, and it's slow motion. Oh. Boom! Light them suckers up, send them back to hell where they came from. And I was like, yo, <laughs> I am the dad of the year. I was like, I was like, yes, indeed. Because in that moment, I was doing what I was called to do, to protect my family, to fight off the enemy. There was an enemy to my family that I had to address. Right now, there's an enemy to your soul, to your purpose, to your walk with Jesus that you have to address. You've got to do something about it. You might, not, you might not recognize it, but I want you to be open 
and begin to believe and challenge your faith and say, is this an attack of the enemy? I need to begin to pray with power and authority against that thing. When Brooke and I pray, sometimes we can speak that, speak to that thing. Whatever we're feeling, the spirit of oppression, or depression, or sickness, we'll speak to that thing. In Jesus' name, get out of this house. Leave my son alone. Leave my family alone in Jesus' name. You begin to do that, you begin to pray that way, and you begin to fight some more and win some more battles. And I want you to walk in the power and the authority of Jesus. The enemy wants to do one, only one thing. He wants to do three things, but this is what he always wants to do. The Bible says in John 10, 10, that the enemy comes, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. He's after you. But the Bible says that Jesus comes to give us a rich and a satisfying life. The power of Jesus, the authority of Jesus lives inside of us. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's message from Anchor Chapel. If you'd like to give to the ministry of Anchor, you can give online at anchorchapel.com or even follow us on social media at Anchor Chapel. Be blessed and we'll see you next week.